In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today, I think, in a lot of ways, is very timely. I really didn't plan this. I didn't even know what the coronavirus was when I planned our little session on 1 Samuel. But it has been so timely, and I think it really does show how a story from years and years ago, I mean, we're talking before the time of Christ, roughly, you know, 3,000 years ago, is still prevalent today because human nature doesn't change and God doesn't change. And so all of these things still hold true to this very day. The, the way that we have had a lot of questions as a society here recently about the role of Christians and whether or not they are to obey governments and exactly what form that takes and what that looks like and where are the lines, where are the limits, where do you stop? This is going to be another case study really in that. And so let's go ahead and look at 1 Samuel 12, 14 through 15. And remember, this is where Samuel is basically, he's already anointed Saul as king. He's already started his sign off and he's basically giving some, some parting advice to Israel on how they should be. So here is Samuel speaking in 1 Samuel 12, 14 through 15, where he says, if you will fear the Lord and serve him, and listen to his voice, and not rebel against the command of the Lord, then both you and also the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. If you will not listen to the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. On its surface, this verse is just a warning given to Israel, which, I mean, it is. That's not an incorrect understanding of this passage. It's just a warning given to Israel coupled with a promise, which are pretty common in the Old Testament. We see all the time where God will say something to very similar effect, that if you listen to me, if you keep my commandments, you will be blessed. If you refuse to do so, you're going to face unforeseen consequences, sometimes in the form of direct punishment where I do something to you, sometimes just because you fall victim to the circumstances of your own choices, but regardless, you're going to see something really terrible happen. But adding the context and putting in exactly what this means and, and what he's talking about here really adds a, a lot of nuance to what that looks like. It, it fleshes the, the very simple, very common theme out a little bit more in application. So I want you to, to notice here that obeying God is something that you're commanded to do even over the king. Now, we don't have a king in America, so that's a little hard for us to relate to. And we haven't had a king for 240 years. But the thing that's important to really take away from that is that whether it's the king or the government that's been put there, because what do we learn in the New Testament from Paul? He says that they, they bear the sword basically as an instrument of God's will. That doesn't mean that he approves of everything that government does, but it means that if they have it, then God is going to use it to his advantage. And even with terrible, evil, wicked people that hate God and, and want to destroy him, he uses even them to do that. And so one of the things that he is pointing out here is that obedience to God is not contingent upon the king. Even though in this circumstance, Saul was literally God's anointed. It is a person who God himself, through a prophet, chose out of the masses of Israel and said, this is my guy. This is going to be your king. He is the person I have chosen to be the leader over my nation of Israel. Even that person, his words don't supersede mine. He doesn't get to talk for me. You obey me, you don't obey him. You obey him with the authority that I have imparted to him, but remember that that authority comes directly from me, and if he's saying one thing, I'm saying another, you go with me. You go with God. You don't listen to the king if he's telling you to do something that would be contrary to what I have told you to do. And so that's the first thing. When we're talking about government and God, 
if government's telling you to do one thing, God's telling you to do something else, you go with God, you don't listen to the government because his laws are higher than man's laws. That's something that's consistent through the Old and the New Testament. And it doesn't even just specifically go for kings. Even the apostles and the prophets told people, if I start saying something that is contrary to God's will, if you start looking through the scriptures and like, wait a second, this doesn't comport at all. You listen to God, not me. Paul himself said that. And so here we are with Samuel issuing a very similar warning to the children of Israel. And what does that mean when we apply that? Well, for one, it means that really, even though the king has certain privileges, certain things that he could do that the children of Israel couldn't do from a governmental standpoint, even though his station was a little bit more prestigious on earth than it was for the average Israelite, they're all supposed to be obedient to God. The guy who is working farmland and is dirt poor and can barely afford to feed his own family out in, you know, uh, Rabosh Gilead or Bethlehem, that guy is just as accountable to God, just as required to be obedient to him as King Saul is. So, yeah, they, they may have very different stations in life. They ha may have wildly different incomes, wildly different lifestyles. Doesn't matter. They're human beings. They're all accountable to me. They all have to be obedient to me. Saul's authority is derived from, from me, has, has been derived from God's power to begin with, and so he's just as responsible to obey me and to do what I commanded him to do. That's what God's saying as anybody else. He's not privileged. He's not special. He just has a different task than you. And that's really something that we see in the church today, too, isn't it? It's not that deacons and elders and ministers, it's not that these people are superhuman or that they're above reproach or that they get to speak for God or any of those things. They have different roles, but God doesn't value one above the other. God doesn't say to this one that, that your service is less important because you don't have the prestigious office that I've imparted to someone that's an elder or a deacon or a minister. That, that's not how God's kingdom works, and that's not how the kingdom of Israel worked back then either. And another thing that I think is interesting here is that the way that it talks about it, it also implies, which is something that turns out to be true, that godly people are a blessing to the king, and that a godly king is a blessing to his people. Now, like this verse says, the best thing that you can do is to have both of them working together. So if, if the king follows you and, or sorry, the king follows God and the people are following God, well, well, that's the ideal. That's what we're all striving for. That's what we all should be working toward. But here is Samuel, God speaking to his people through Samuel, where he says, but if you are godly people, regardless of who your king is, you'll be a blessing to that person. If the king is godly, even if his people stray away, even if his people aren't doing what they should be, that good king is going to be a blessing to his people. That's what the New Testament tells us. Look, Christians should be the best workers, the best bosses, the best uh, government officials, the best service. I mean, if, if you have a Christian that's working in a restaurant like, like I have before, they should be the best of all of those things because they are the people that treat other people the way that they would want to be treated. They treat other people like they were serving Christ himself. That doesn't always happen in application, but as this verse implies, that's what we are trying to do. That a godly people is going to be a blessing to that nation, a blessing to other nations. A godly king is going to be a blessing to that people. But if you don't have one, that's not an excuse for you not being the other. In other words, if you have a king that's not godly, that's not an excuse for you people to not be godly. You're still going to be held accountable to that. But if you will be godly, even if you have a king that's not godly, you'll be a blessing to them. Who knows, you might even change him because of that. But the other side of that, the other side that I think is equally important is that rebellion equals punishment. It was the true then, it's true now. Rebellion equals punishment. You rebel against God, you rebel against His will, punishment is going to follow, whether it's God directly punishing you, or again, you just fall victim to the circumstances of your own choices. Either way, bad things are going to happen. 
And that was true even back then as it is true now. But obedience can take place regardless of the form of government. You notice how that particular commandment didn't change? Because there were judges, there was some government structure, it was very loose, but there was some government structure that existed before Israel had a king. Well, they were called to obedience then. And now that they have a king, they're also called to obedience. Living a godly lifestyle, living the way that God commanded them to do, that remains the same. And so you can be a godly person, whether you're living under a good government, a bad government, a monarchy, a dictatorship, regardless of what it is. No matter what form of government it takes, whether it's a Greek democracy, a Roman Senate, an American Republic, any of those things, then you still have the obligation to obey God, to listen to his word, to be godly, to be a good citizen. All of those things remain the same. Sure, the way that that plays out, the way that that looks might change a little bit based on the form of government or the kind of government or whether the people running that government are godly. Ultimately, you're still responsible to God first and foremost, and obedience is still called for. In other words, Israel having a bad king didn't let them off the hook. When they had a king that was ungodly, the fact that they were ungodly didn't mean that, oh, well, they're not responsible for it because now they've got a king. In the same way, they could not just be considered in God's good graces just because they had a good king. I mean, do you think that God looked over murderers and liars and, and all of the other things that went on while David was king just because he was king? No, of course he didn't. And so the command of obedience is a personal one. Ultimately, just like it was back then, it, it's just as true now, God wanted a personal relationship with his people. He wanted his people to love him and obey him and to listen to his commandments. He wanted it then, he wants it now. And if we'll do that, then regardless of what form our government takes, no matter what political wind comes next and, and shifts our government, even if we wind up, God forbid this happens, but even if we wind up being taken over or America is no longer a free country, if we wind up a dictatorship or some kind of socialist experiment, whatever, ultimately our call to be obedient to God remains the same and it always will. Let's make sure we get that right. And everything else, even if it's less than ideal like Israel has here, it's all going to fall into place eventually. Because primarily our relationship with God is a personal one. One that can't be irreparably damaged by government or really anything else in this world. Stay the course, friends. Ever wonder where Superman gets his incredible powers? Some people say it's the yellow son of Earth, but I think it's because he subscribes to this channel and likes my videos. Now, I'm not saying that if you subscribe to my channel you'll necessarily wake up tomorrow as a super strong, nearly invincible alien, but it definitely doesn't hurt your chances.